Hello, and welcome back to the Buddhist Studies Podcast. We are here today with Dr. Maria Haim, who is the instructor for Buddhist Studies Online 202, the Sudhi Maga, the Path of Purification. Maria Haim is the George Lyman Crosby 1896 and Stanley Warfield Crosby Professor in Religion at Amherst College. She received her PhD at Harvard University in 1999, received a Guggenheim Fellowship in 2005, She's also the author of three books dealing with Buddha Gosa and is also working on the role of emotions in ancient and classical India. And finally, she is currently translating the Melinda Panha for the Murti Classical Library. So thank you to Maria Haim for speaking with us today. Thank you very much, Kate. I'm really delighted to have the chance to speak with you. And also I'm very much looking forward to teaching the course in a few weeks. Yes, I'm looking forward to it as well, particularly right after this course on the Bodhicharya Avatara, these two important path texts thinking about, you know, how do you string together these various Buddhist teachings to come up with one overarching account of the Buddhist path? So maybe we can start with um, just how did you find yourself in Buddhist studies? How did you get into this field? Okay, well, good. Yeah, thank you. I, um, I, I, uh, I guess it would probably be traced back to my undergraduate days. Um, I had, I didn't come from a particularly academic family or anything like that, but I, I went to college knowing I wanted to study religion and philosophy. And so I immediately signed up for two majors and was ready to go with an interest, some idea that I was interest in, interested in non-Western traditions. Um, and so I, I happened to be very lucky. Uh, I was at a small liberal arts college, Reed College in Oregon, and um, I uh, wound up being able to take a lot of courses in Indian philosophy and Indian religion and ultimately two years of Sanskrit as an undergraduate with uh, a professor uh, that was called Edwin Giroux at that time. And Professor Giroux had been a very esteemed um, Indologist at the University of Chicago for many decades before that, but shortly before he retired, he wanted to live in Oregon, and uh, he taught uh, uh, um, at Reed College for several years, and that overlapped when I was there, and so I got my start in Indian thought um, there, and I would say that I, I am part of Buddhist studies, but I, I think of myself really as a scholar of, of classical India, um, more than specifically Buddhist studies. So for me, Buddhism is part of a larger intellectual and literary and philosophical world that uh, I've been pretty engaged in ever since those uh, early days in the late uh, 80s and early 90s. Yeah, and why is it, um, that's a really helpful comment to, that you see yourself as more of a scholar of this period of time and place rather than in one particular religious tradition. Um, what do you think that that adds, or what do you think you're missing if you just, you know, see yourself pretty narrowly as a scholar of Buddhism? Yeah, yeah. So for me, it was for so long, all through my my PhD uh, program, I was never really able to just settle on one tradition. I, I worked with uh, Charlie Hallisey. I did a lot of work on Pali Buddhism, uh, Theravada Buddhism, um, but I also went to India and I studied Hindu Dharma Shastra and I studied with a Jain Sadhu and I was very interested in the conversations and the, the broader you know, set of questions and the broader milieu in which all of these um, systems of thought and literatures were uh, shaped by and also contributing to. So for me, that's always what it was. It was never specifically about Buddhism. It was always how Buddhism is one player within a larger intellectual world. Um, you know, and so, but that's just me. I mean, I, I think there's also very good reasons to, for people to sort of specialize in one particular tradition versus another. But, um, but you do lose a little bit of that conversational, dialogical, broader context. Um, and of course, India has this incredibly rich literary and philosophical world that, um, that Buddhism, for me, at least the, the kind of Buddhism I study is just one part of. Um, so that's, but that's just me. And then eventually after I finished my graduate uh, degree, I went and um, I did sort of know I should sort of drill down into one particular tradition. And so then I, uh, after really finishing um, 
my PhD, I really spent the last several decades um, working with Buddhaghosa. I mean, I, so I've also had that benefit um, and the privilege really of being able to, to immerse myself in one thinker, one, in this case, I think really a polymath type of a thinker uh, for decades. And so I, 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 I like both the wide angle view uh, that I felt like I was trained in, but also I'm grateful to have had the opportunity to, um, to really to become a student of um, one particular system of thought, uh, really. And so um, I think ideally, if you can try to have both, uh, for those of you who are young scholars out there, um, that it gives you a set of questions that you bring to the particular study that you're doing, that you might not see if you're only part of that, but at the same time, you get the depth um, of, of working with one particular text or set of texts that, um, that is, I think, important for us now at the point we are at with scholarship to really begin to make advancements. I think that framework, too, of thinking in terms of conversations is a really helpful one that I try to communicate to students that, you know, never are we looking at sort of a lone voice who is narrating you know, the Buddhist tradition, mm -hmm. or even if they are narrating what they believe is the Buddhist tradition, they are doing so in conversation with others, um, with competing ideas. And so looking at, you know, classical South Asia as this, you know, multivocal conversation between different thinkers and different traditions and all sorts of different people, I think can focus one's attention, even when, we, when you do focus on a single thinker, to the fact that they are participating in that kind of broader conversation. Yeah. Yes, and that's been very true with Buddhaghosa. I mean, he was, we think he was a figure who was trained in Sanskrit um, knowledge systems before he came into Buddhism. And you can see the imprint of knowledge of Panini's grammar, and you can see the imprint of a, of a Sanskrit pundit, even though he's working in Pali and very much within uh, Theravada and helping to construct Theravada orthodoxy uh, in, a, in, a, in a rather different context. So for me, that, uh, that dialogical or that contextual and conversational uh, part of it has been, has been important for even simply understanding him. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's really helpful. And perhaps we could even take a step back now that we've mentioned Buddhaghosa a couple of times to just introduce him to listeners who may or may not be you know, familiar with him and with his role in shaping the history of Buddhism generally and Theravada Buddhism in particular. Okay, yes, good. So Buddhaghosa is a fifth century figure, we believe. So he lived maybe even 900, 1,000 years after the Buddha. Um, and he's, he's, historically, he's really shrouded by, you know, the mists of, of history. We don't know that much about him, but uh, he is credited uh, by the Pali or the Theravada tradition with being the chief editor and translator of um, the Pali commentaries, which were had been preserved some of this material we think goes back to the buddha that had sort of always been kind of alongside of the canonical material the, the canonical texts um, but we have a large body of material that had accompanied it and developed over time but it wasn't in pali until buddhaghosa came on the scene in sri lanka and was entrusted with um translating and editing and putting that body of material in the language of Pali, which was a translocal language uh, that the canonical material was preserved in. And so um, we don't know the extent to which that project was um, only carried out by him. I tend to think that he was the, the head of a team of scholars. And it's a huge amount of output um, and intellectual work. Um, or to what extent we, we no longer have the ancient Sinhala uh, materials from which he was uh, editing and translating. So we don't know to what extent he added some original uh, interpretations or to what extent, you know, how creative his hand was in that process. But um, he, nevertheless, his name comes out on most of it. Um, and uh, that's so, and, and, and what it is, is, is a hugely syst systematic, um, body of knowledge of that that that's how to interpret the buddhist scriptures um in in all of the different uh the three different um pitikas 
Um, so, which is to say the three different baskets that the suttas, the Buddhist discourses, and then the Vinaya, which is the monastic literature, and then the Abhidhamma, which is this kind of second order, um, further reflection about basically sort of human psychology. Um, so he he's credited with doing most of those uh, commentaries. Now, modern scholars debate about to what extent uh, he has actually had a hand in all of that commentarial work. Um, but that's where he sort of sits in the tradition. In addition, uh, and quite relevant for our class, is that he, um, he wrote this book uh, called the Vasudhi Maga, which again had some precursors. Um, he didn't write it just uh, ex nihilo, um, but he, and there's a beautiful story about how he came to write it. He was sort of entrusted with uh, a, trying to write a commentary on just two verses from the, 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 the monastic authorities had given him um, to see if he was up to this commentarial project. Uh, and he wrote this nearly 800 page <laughs> text called The Path of Purification, uh, the Sudhi Maga. And then it disappeared. So like it just vanished. And, um, and then he wrote it again and that copy disappeared. And then he wrote it again and the gods returned with the first two copies. And it, and it turns out that um, the, all three copies are exactly identical. So regardless of the historical veracity of this claim, uh, it does suggest some very important intellectual values here that Buddhaghosa was consistent. Um, he was, you know, authentic. Um, he knew what he was doing, and um, he then came to be called at this point Buddhaghosa, the voice of the Buddha, uh, which is a very sort of high praise uh, for him. So the Vasudhi Magga then is a kind of, um, even though it's still itself a long text, it is a kind of, he calls it the hub of his larger commentarial system. So it's kind of the center uh, system. <laughs> um, of, of this much larger commentarial project he was a part of. And it's organized as, as Kate said earlier, a path. It's a path for purification. It's a path for how you practice the whole Buddhist life as a monastic, starting with morality, working through meditation and, and arriving at insight or wisdom or understanding. Um, and so it's, it's very much part of that larger path metaphor that is so widely um, practiced in, in Buddhism and in lots of other Indian texts. Um, so it's many other things uh, that we'll be talking about in the class. There's a lot of different ways to read the Vasudhi Magga. It's a very big text. It's a very dense text. It's a very scholastic type text. Um, it's, it's pretty formidable uh, as, a, as, a, as a kind of treatise, um, but it is comprehensible and it's brilliant. And we'll be spending time trying to find the strategies that I've learned from, from spending a lot of time with Buddhaghosa to learning how to read it. Great, thank you for that um, overview of Buddhaghosa and the Vasudhi Magga itself. Um, you know, one question that I've heard students ask is why a text like this was necessary. So, you know, from the perspective of the Buddhist tradition, we have the Buddha's words as preserved in the Pali Canon. Um, why is this sort of commentarial project necessary? You know, and, and we as historians know that commentary is one of the primary ways that, you know, later Buddhist traditions have engaged the teachings of the Buddha um, and engage Buddhist texts more generally. But I think this is perhaps somewhat confusing for a student who's new to the Buddhist tradition. Why don't we just go and read the suttas or something? Why is the Visuddhi Magga necessary? Great, so that's a really great question. And I think there's lots of different ways to kind of pick it up. So one way to pick it up is that um, the Visuddhi Magga, even though it is sort of huge, <laughs> Um, it, it's still a kind of summary of the path. Um, so it, it functions, you know, the Buddha's own words are huge. It takes multiple, you know, just for the suttas alone, we have, you know, a half a library shelf full of material. Um, so in that way, and, and then uh, layers of commentary subsequently on that. So in that way, the, the Vasudhi Magga is at least, you know, catching between the covers of one book, a kind of handbook or a summary or a systematized uh, very clear and orderly path. So that's one kind of an answer. The second answer I would give you is I, I think it's a little bit of a kind of Protestant, um, you know, we in religion often are facing Protestant Christian assumptions about religion and about texts that we're always trying to sort of 
get out from underneath. Um, and that idea that one just goes to the scripture oneself and, and, and it will be perfectly clear um, is, is, is part of a kind of Protestant discourse about going straight to the original sources. And that's really true. And there are many beautiful places in the suttas where we can just go directly to it the suit doesn't understand it and probably should uh, read it in an unmediated way. But uh, having said that, the tradition has always thought that you would study this material in the presence of a teacher, um, an authority, somebody who really knows their stuff, um, who's deeply immersed within the tradition. And so the commentaries have always, uh, within the traditional forms of knowledge, been um, part of a lineage of teachers that help you interpret the scripture. Um, and so Buddha Ghost is, himself stands at, 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 you know, within a tradition. He very much identifies himself as being part of the Mahavihara tradition of interpretation and sees himself as um, committing that uh, interpretation to the future uh, as a way to help people understand uh, a, a, the scriptures. So I, I'm drawn to that as a kind of, um, I don't think his way of reading the early Pali suttas is the only way to read, um, uh, to read scripture. I think that the, the, and he himself sees, one of the things I've been really interested in is he thinks that he has a whole theory of the Buddha's words, Buddha Vachana, Buddha's words as being um, endlessly meaningful. Um, so he's very, super interested in that. So, um, but I also have a deep respect for being part of a lineage of teachers and tradition uh, of people who know the tradition far better than I do, who have read it in a certain kind of way that um, is just interesting and important in its own right. Um, so that would be another kind of answer I would give to some of your students. Mm -hmm. And you know, another thing that always strikes me is, you know, sometimes when one is reading suttas, one is very clearly aware, the suttas make it clear that this was preached to a particular person at a particular time on a particular occasion. Mm -hmm. um, Buddhist text always open with a nidana that makes it clear, you know, who, what, when, where, why. Mm -hmm. um, and so one question is often how to take these many, many texts, as you said, it fills a whole, you know, shelf full of suttas, um, preaching to different people at different times, you know, how do you put that together into one path? And so how do you think of Buddhaghosa as having approached that topic? Like, how is he reading these materials in order to put them together? Okay, great. Yeah, this is, um, I've been super, so one of my books that Kate mentioned, I've written several books on Buddhaghosa, but one of them is, is really what Buddha goes his theory of texts are, what he thought Buddha's scripture, Buddhist scriptures is, and then what the entailments are for, for our interpreting uh, Buddhist scripture. And so he was interested in, in both of those types of, both sides of that, Kate, really. So one is that we have a deeply, uh, in, this, in the suttas themselves, um, a deeply situated kind of knowledge. So that, uh, as Kate mentioned, uh, the suttas are always, located in a particular, the Buddha is giving a particular teaching to a particular audience at a particular place at a particular time for a particular purpose. And so Buddha Gosa really notices that. He's very interested in the situatedness of the audience. And the, the Buddha was speaking to particular people because he knew what those people needed to hear from him. So he's very interested in contextual, situated, dialogical knowledge like that, and that aspect of how the sutras come down to us. At the same time, he's interested in precisely that, that process of abstra abstracting that knowledge uh, and taking it out of its particular situated uh, nature and putting it in a handbook like the Vasudhi Maga or understanding how a lot of that um, philosophical knowledge is abstracted out of the particular narrative context in which it was first delivered and put into the Abhidhamma, which strips away a lot of those particulars and, and is, is aiming to get at a more um, sort of universal kind of uh, idiom uh, that speaks uh, not just to a particular context, but to all contexts. So he's he knows that feature about Buddhist knowledge, that it is both um, 
located in a, spa a place and a time to particular people, but he also wants it to speak outside of that context and he's interested in learning how to make it do so. So the Vasudhi Maga, reading the Vasudhi Maga is watching him um, reorganize, if you will, um, to a particular purpose, giving us a very clear path, knowledge that came up much less systematically in a, a whole variety of different contexts in the suttas. Um, and that in and of itself is a particular kind of packaging um, that has very, I think, very principled choices uh, governing it. Um, but it is a set, also a set of choices that themselves are interesting to, to try to watch and to, to even notice are happening. Oh, and what are some of these choices? I'm, I'm interested to follow up on that. Um, well, um, uh, so some of it, I think, is that he is creating, um, and this isn't new for me to observe, but he's creating a particular path of samadhi meditations that go further and beyond what we just can just see in the suttas. Um, so the, the working out starting, I believe, with the earth, well, it definitely starts with the earth casino, something we'll talk about, um, and laying that out in a kind of very systematic way from starting with this and ending with that is something that goes further um, than we see it uh, pop up in the, in the suttas. So that's, a, I think, a further systematization um, then, then we get in the suttas with the meditation practices. Um, but again, I don't think he's probably inventing this out of thin air. I think he's probably seeing that as part of the tradition he's inherited. Um, but, but we're getting an effort to think about those practices in relationship to anybody who might start the monastic path and here's where they would begin. Okay. So there's kind of like a, a principle of ordering of saying, you know, there's sort of steps and you know, your, your progress on the path will go a lot better if you do this first and then this next and then this next. And um, there's sort of a logical organization to it. Yeah. And, and this does, in fact, you know, govern the logic of the Visuddhimagga, Visuddhimagga as a whole. Uh, we see that it's split into these three parts of shila, morality, samadhi, which you translate as concentration, and then panya of wisdom. Um, so maybe you could say a little something about this kind of division. Um, what is the kind of structure governing this, this organization? You know, so one thing I often, you know, challenge my students with is we'll read a particular sutra, sutta in which the Buddha, you know, talks about this particular order. And, you know, why is it that this sort of moral discipline thing is placed first, is placed before concentration or wisdom? Good, yeah, good question. So um, this, this schema of sila, samadhi, panya, of morality, concentration, and wisdom is something he's getting right out of the suttas. So you could go, for example, and look in the Diga Nikaya, in the, the, the sutta of the Buddha's last days and the Buddha's parinirvana's death. And right before the Buddha dies, he goes around uh, to all of his, many, many of his communities that he had sort of established across North India. And he gives them what's called a comprehensive discourse. And it's Sila Samadhi Pana. So it's this, this, and so we see that Buddhaghosa isn't sort of pulling this out of thin air. He sees that when the Buddha wanted to be comprehensive, when he was sort of going around to um, his communities right before he dies and consolidating what he had taught, this is what he teaches them. So that it was a very good choice, right, to kind of organize his own uh, handbook um, based on that. But why see why this ordering? Um, and I think that what it is is that that it's sort of a movement from gross to fine, which we see in a lot of Indian thought. Like, how do you move from the grossest um, big kind of work you need to do? Uh, to refine your morality, to increasing uh, practices of refining one's experience emotionally and mentally to the finest kind of practices of, of deeper knowledge. And so it's very much that movement. So that morality is stopping um, the 10 immoral action, stopping killing and stealing and lying and um, using 
harsh language. And um, so the whole series of things of just stopping doing that is what is meant by morality or virtue. And that I think he thought that it would be difficult to even start a meditation practice if you were distracted by um, immoral actions. Um, not that there's a practical level of it that, you know, if you're killing people or stealing from them, you know, there'll be a knock on the door when you sit on your meditation cushion and you're in trouble in all kinds of ways. So it's very hard to, to actually set up a, the kind of meditation, the full, full kind of professional meditation practice he's interested in if you are in a, the kind of practicing immoral actions. Um, they're very distracting. They're very um, problematic. And so I think it's a very practical thing. You just have to stop stop doing immoral things so that you, your mind can settle down so you can, get, you can do the kind of work you need to do, which is really radically transformative in meditation practice. Right. And then the, the sequence from the meditation practice to the understanding or the wisdom is that the meditation practice is about, again, about removal, stopping doing things, not just gross, Im, you know, immoral behavior, but getting rid of problematic states of mind, of, of lust or greed or hatred um, or a fluttering, distracted mind. So it's very specific, targeted techniques of removal so that the mind can settle and you can start to see the way things are, which is where you, know, you start moving into the, the final section of the Vasudhi Magga on understanding our wisdom. And there, as you'll see, if you take the course, you'll see that by the time we get there, I really see him, for him, understanding or wisdom, panya, panya is, um, is a practice. It's a set of um, practices of how you come to see the world. It's not one day you open your eyes and you've, you know, you've now achieved perfect insight. It, it continues to be a set of, uh, of practices of knowing and seeing, as he puts it. So that goes on for many, many chapters, uh, the wisdom uh, section. Um, and that the whole thing is um, about practices of analysis and practices of knowing and seeing that you, 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 you develop in a more and more refined way from start to finish. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's, that's a great overview. And so uh, the, the title of the Visuddhi Magga, as it's often translated, is The Path of Purification. And so um, the account that you've given is one of sort of stopping or removing things. So, so how is this process supposed to gradually work on the, the mind? Is this, you know, the, the path of purification analogous to purifying what was always there in the mind but was obscured by something? Are you cultivating something new in the mind? How do, how do you think about this sort of central metaphor of purification in relation to that path? So that's a good question. So yeah, I do think, I mean, that there is in the, in the canonical material in the suttas themselves, we have this, this metaphor of um, purification with respect to gold, um, that if you want to have beautiful, shiny and pliable gold, you have to constantly take stuff out. You have to remove the base metals and you have to remove the impurities. And so purification is, as I think it's working here is this process of removing the grit and the impurification and the impurities and the bad stuff so that um, gold, right? Your experience would become shiny and brilliant and beautiful and pliable, right? Pliable, pliability is also important. And so I, I do think that that's the metaphor here that, that it's about removing the coarse stuff at the level of morality and then removing um, the, the negative emotions and the, the toxic experiences and pathologies that we all have as part of our um, emotional lives um, through the, the meditation section so that we can gradually start to see in a broader and wider and more clear vision. So um, I think that, that that's probably how I would, how I would wanna talk about purification um, and that, that metaphor. Mm -hmm. And certainly we do see that, that metaphor about, you know, gold and the purification of gold um, in the, the suttas themselves as well. Um, and this reminds me of something I think that you've already written, but is still forthcoming. Um, you wrote in a, what seems like a book chapter, Taking Refuge in Jewels, in a forthcoming volume by Vanessa Sassan called Jewels, Jewelry, and Other Shiny Things in the Buddhist Imaginary. <laughs> yeah. And I, I heard an interview with her talking about it, and I was just fascinated by this book because she was like, 
you know, in teaching students, all of us face this question of, you know, Buddhism does have this kind of anti-materialist, you know, don't be attached to things uh, kind of vibe to it. And yet Buddhist texts are always talking about gold, always talking about jewels, use metaphors of jewels and things like that. And so, you know, perhaps this will take us away from Buddhaghosa for just a minute, but um, I'm just interested in the way that narratives of gold and jewels as these kind of metaphors for either the mind that we're trying to achieve or for the Buddhist tradition itself uh, function or, or, or what you're going to say in this article that I haven't been able to read yet because the book hasn't come out. Oh, okay. Yeah, no, so that was a very fun project that uh, my friend and colleague Vanessa set up, um, noticing that, as you say, everywhere there is bling, right? Everywhere, shiny stuff, uh, jewels, fabulous worlds, um, but a lot of jewel imagery. And, and so she got a bunch of us together and, and had us take this up. Um, and I think, I mean, there's all kinds of ways you could answer that question. Um, one is that we tend to, I, I think, probably overemphasize the ascetic, um, dark, you know, vision of human life that Buddhism uh, gives us in terms of its, uh, to emphasize suffering and uh, the ascetic turning away from desires. That that's all there. It's all extremely important. Um, but on the other hand, um, I just gave a talk a few weeks ago about happiness, how much happiness and beauty, you know, some beautiful experiences is, is propounded in the early suttas. Um, and um, that the Buddha was recognizing all kinds of different kinds of happiness, including the happiness associated with wealth. Um, he spoke to different kinds of people for whom wealth and the pursuit of wealth is perfectly uh, appropriate. Um, clearly, the, 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 Buddhist, the early Buddhist sources are speaking to um, an up and coming world of merchan, merchants and kings and socially prosperous people, um, and that it reflects that world and it speaks to it in important ways. So if we look more broadly, so sociologically at even what the Buddhist texts themselves teach us about the, the communities of people who were interested in it, we're not only ever talking to ascetics who are world renouncers who are denying the values and good things of, of this life, but he is talking and finding ways to talk to uh, really broad, a broad spectrum of people in society. And, and their jewels are really, really important um, as Vanessa's book uh, kind of starts to, to begin to mine, if you will. Um, my own piece on, in that is trying to figure out from Buddhaghosa's reading of um, what it means to take refuge in jewels. So we have this idea of taking refuge in the triple gem is a very standard formula um, for what conversion really means to become a Buddhist is to take refuge in three jewels, the, the Buddha the Dhamma, the teaching, and the Sangha, the community. Well, there's that jewel imagery. What does it mean to take refuge in a jewel? Um, it doesn't mean, you know, buying a diamond ring from Tiffany's, right? It means something rather different, you know, and yet it's pretty interesting, a pretty interesting metaphor uh, for these uh, central values within the tradition. So I tried to plunge into uh, Buddhaghosa's reading of the, the Ratana Sutta, the Jewel Sutta, to see how what he's doing with that symbol and how he's how he's working it out. Mm -hmm. And and what does he do with that symbol? Um, I've always taken the jewel metaphor to indicate something that is you know precious and rare. Yeah, um, I, I don't think I thought too much farther than that. But just knowing how Buddhaghosa again, with this hermeneutic, as you said, of treating the Buddha's words as endlessly meaningful, I'm sure is able to give us, you know, ways of thinking about this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he gets it's really quite subtle what he does with it. But basically, he says that a jewel is something that is um, the best and most esteemed thing of its class. So that the jewel suttas, this particular little sutta and the sutta nipata that, um, that kind of keeps going through and each line ends with um, and I can't remember exactly how it goes, but each line ends with saying, but the, but the Buddha is greater than all other jewels, or the Sangha is greater than all other jewels. He's a jewel that's greater than all other jewels. And so it's like, well, you know, exactly what does this mean? And so Buddhaghosa works it out so that um, a jewel that is better than all other jewels is in some ways um, a bit of a, um, uh, I guess, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, a puzzle in that um, 
what does it mean for a jewel to be better than all other jewels and still be a jewel? And so basically what he wants to say is that the Buddha and the Sangha and the um, Dhamma exceed, the jewel is the language we use when we want to describe them exceeding um, anything in their class. And so that jewel comes to mean that. Um, and I don't know how widely that goes outside of his particular interpretation, or if most people walk around with that view of what a jewel means, but that's where he goes with it as a way of just basically naming or symbolically naming um, the incommensurability of these three things in human life. And I will put um, a translation to this jewel sutta uh, from Access to Insight in the okay. show. <laughs> it's, a, it's a short little sutta, so um, people can That's see. Okay. And again, I'm not remembering exactly even what I said in that, um, but uh, something like that, so people can look for themselves and think about this metaphor. Mm -hmm. Yes, and that's, you know, another thing that I'm always sort of trying to um, understand better myself and understand better with my students is that these metaphors are sort of endlessly generative. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, sometimes reading a Buddha Sitta, you'll see just sort of metaphor after metaphor, or praise word after praise word, and you can kind of find yourself skipping over them <laughs> yeah. after a while. Um, but actually really stopping to pause and say, well, what does it mean that this is a jewel? You know, what does that suggest? That, and, and thinking about the generativity of these metaphors is actually one of the reasons that I find commentators like Buddhaghosa endlessly helpful because Buddhaghosa is not one to skip over any line without thinking really deeply about what it means. And then it, you know, leads me to, to, to read a bit more deeply. Um, Yes. So well, I think I think that I think that that's totally right. That um, you know our our eyes tend to glaze over with some of these endless praises of the Buddha, right? And we just sort of they wash over us at a certain point after you've been reading a lot of suttas. But as Kate does say, that you know Buddhaghosa does not <laughs> let you do that. So you slow down with um, with Buddhaghosa a great deal and linger over um, key, you know praises of the Buddha. And for him, one of the things I've tried to show in my book about the, about um, what he goes with hermeneutics or his interpretive practices, that's really crucial for how he's reading. So um, often the Buddha is said to be, um, that his words are said to be endless and immeasurable. And that sounds lovely. Oh, his words are endless and immeasurable. But but it also takes it really seriously that this is a huge claim about scripture that it, it's endless and immeasurable. You know, it's basically a claim about scriptural infinity, and the endless meaning of what the Buddhist words uh, uh, can have as they come in front of new people into the future. Right. So it, the, his Buddha's words will mean something different to everyone who comes in front of it in terms of how they speak to his or her particular life. Um, but, uh, that they go, that it go, the Buddha's words go into the future in a way that is continuing to develop and generate new meaning is, is something Buddha goes, takes very, very seriously. And then he's, as a commentator is trying to figure out how does that happen? So he's sort of in awe of it. Um, but then he's also trying to figure out, well, how does that happen? It's not that the Buddha's words can mean anything, anything goes, what are the constraints on interpretation? Um, when you're, but when you're faced with something that is, that is endlessly generative. So that's the kind of thing I think that when we slow down and, and really pay attention to the praises and um, some of the highly repetitive um, extolling of the qualities of the Buddha or the Dharma, uh, we start to open up, in, in this case, I think a whole theory of texts um, and a whole set of commentarial practices that, that Buddha Gosa felt uh, were entailed by that theory of texts that can give us a new way to, to read the Buddhist texts and to see what the tradition is doing with them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've always been struck by the way that the Buddha is supposed to have been able to speak. And, and one anecdote I often you know, share with the students is the Buddha is supposed to have been able to sit up in front of a crowd of many people speaking mutually unintelligible languages. You know, <laughs> in ancient India, there are a lot of different dialects, that sort of thing. And yet each person heard what they sort of needed to hear on that day in their own mother tongue. Yes. And, and what does it mean to think about language as having this capacity? Yes. to speak to different people where they are. And yet, as you're saying, um, not just be, you know, totally anything goes. Yeah, that's right. So that's another kind of praise that we see that the Buddha was able to, that the Buddha was a knower of, of the latent dispositions of all beings. And so he knew this is part of 
what's a very important theory about the Buddha in the commentarial level, at least, that the Buddha was omniscient. And so one of the, 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 the forms that that omniscience takes is that he knows people's backstory. He knows what they're bringing to the, to, to, as an audience. Um, and he's able to speak to them in their individual particular set of circumstances. Um, even while he's using the same words and the same, you know, teaching that speaks to everybody in their particularity. So this is a very beautiful and interesting feature of the Buddhist speech. Um, and sometimes as Kate says, it is configured as language. He's using one in the same language and yet it's understood people hear it in the, in the language that they know. Um, and so, Again, it's hard to know exactly what to do with that, except for um, this is something that Buddhaghosa sets up for as a challenge for himself to understand how is it that uh, the Buddha's word, these words specifically in the Buddhist scriptures could do, have this capacity to speak. And it has something to do with the speaker. The Buddha was omniscient, right? And he was a knower of worlds and he knew people's dispositions. Um, but it, so it's a particular kind of language that can do that. Um, and he takes himself to be just trying to, to, to chart that and how it happens. Some of the way he does that is he really, go, he's very interested in the context as we started off this conversation, uh, mentioning the context, the time and the place when a Buddhist uh, sutta was given. And he often invites the readers to follow him into that person's backstory. And it could be a backstory that started re many, many lives ago in that particular person, or that person is embedded in a complex set of circumstances in which this encounter that they wind up having with the Buddha and the Buddha's particular teaching to them speak in a very direct way to their complex of um, of backstory and their, com their, their complex of circumstances in a unique and specific and particular way. So Buddhism, Buddha goes is very interested in that particularism and that knowledge of, of speaking to the individual. Um, and his reading of the suttas is always taking us into those stories in a broader way. So that's one way he's trying to show how it happens uh, in the original context. But I think he thinks that that can continue to happen to us, you know, here we are reading the Buddhist scriptures 2,500 years later, and they land on us differently, um, according to our particular circumstances and our particular set of conditions. Um, we're going to hear the same sutta somewhat differently, according to what was going on in our own lives. And so Buddhaghosa knew that about texts, and uh, he's just sort of fascinated with it. And he sort of was trying to find ways of both showing us how that happens, but also guiding the process a little bit um, to, to, to at least show things that text can't mean uh, sometimes. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure, you know, I have certainly had and listeners will have, you know, experiences where something written in a, a time, and place quite, time and place quite distant to your own will feel like, oh, this was written for me right now, mm -hmm. exactly the sort of situation that I'm bringing to it. And, you know, so this is a really interesting question from you know, a, a Buddhist studies perspective, right? How does the Buddha's speech work in this way? Um, but for me, it's always raised this sort of even broader question of how is it that language, that literature can sometimes work in this way? How is it that something strikes you as being written just for you um, in a way that the author never could have intended, right? right? Sometimes it'll be something that didn't even exist in their time and place. And yet you'll just really feel it strike right home. Yeah, I mean, that's the beauty of reading these texts is we are um, reading something that was written 2,500 years ago or 2,000 years ago in a different language to a different community to, with a whole different set of concerns. And and then I'll put it in front of my uh, students, you know, 21st century students, you know, uh, in a very, very different context. And it speaks to them, right, directly and, and powerfully. And, and, um, and that, to me, is just uh, like where the magic happens right? <laughs> in terms of our teaching and why we're in on this is that and it often can shift things it doesn't it doesn't when when you feel yourself addressed by an ancient text um it's not that you're just having your own sensibilities affirmed often you're being challenged to think in a new way and that that where it really works it's really challenging you um I often put a couple of passages by the French uh, theologian and philosopher Pierre Adot in front of my students about this very experience. Um, and he he didn't work on didn't work on Buddhism at all. He really worked on the Stoics and uh, the Western uh, classical tradition. But he was interested in this process, and he really argues that. Uh, 
first, you have to be really careful to avoid anachronism. You have to be careful not to project your meaning back onto the ancient text. And it's very easy to do that, to think, oh, this is what they're talking about. Or this is my, you know, our concerns and in our time. And that's what the text is speaking to. So he's very, his, his first impulse is to kind of do what you need to do to not do that, right? Um, and to be aware of that as a, as a danger. Um, and that for him is, is, is doing careful philo philological work, the deep study of the language and the context and what the, the intellectual context in which the original text was speaking and, and really doing that deep historical scholarly work to try to understand what the text was saying in its context and what was generating, what were the conditions that produced it and the constraints that produced it and what it was speaking to. But then in a beautiful way, Aldo says, but then once you've done that and you've understood that, in another way, you can often find yourself and perhaps mo most directly once you've done that and you've understand what the text is saying in this deeper way, you can find yourself addressed by it. Um, and that is, he wants to call that the existential meaning of, of a text, the ways that it speaks to us as human beings across you know, the centuries and across time and space um, and addresses us in our human condition and speaks to us in, in our human condition. And so that is really helpful for me to think about both, you know, avoiding anachronism, being like deeply historically aware of a text and what it can and can't mean. And then that opens up a place in which it can speak to us in its specificity um, and in its directness. And that that's just a, a beautiful, magical thing that happens um, <laughs> with text. And that's why so many of us are uh, losing our eyesight and, <laughs> you know, spending decades and decades learning these languages and, and trying to, uh, to, to, to get to understand these texts because of that, that magic. That almost that bit of distanciation uh, of, of setting something in its original context where it might initially seem somewhat more distant from you, the reader, um, placing it in, it in that context can then open up a new way in which it speaks to you. Um, mm -hmm. And that's often what I say as justification. You know, people will ask me, you know, why do you study history? You know, this, this seems incredibly boring and pointless. Um, and part of why I think it's useful is, one, it gets you to slow down. Two, it gets you to put things in their historical context, not so that they stay forever in that historical context, like some piece of museum artwork or some bug trapped in amber, but so that then it can then speak to you again in this new way. I'm also struck by the, the parallelism between what you said before in that when Buddhaghosa is parsing the Buddha's teachings, he'll dive even more specifically into that person's sort of story. Yeah. Um, very, very particular, specific, how that story spoke to them. And then in that, we'll yeah. find kind of perhaps the more universal or the more, um, the thing that speaks beyond that particular context. Yeah, I'm, I'm really glad you spotted that parallel because I definitely want to make something of that and that, yeah, he does think the deeper you go into the original context and then I, in an interesting and almost paradoxical way, the more you're going to emerge from it uh, with an understanding of how it might speak to you. So the, you, you arrive at a more universal, uh, you know, perspective from a deep immersion in the particular um in the particular context and so i yeah i definitely see that parallel between Ado and buddhaghosa um, and i've tried to bring that out a little bit in my book um the voice of the buddha so one other topic that you've devoted a lot of recent research and attention to is the role of the emotions and um you know one thing that i often again, try to call my students' attention to is the role that emotions play in, you know, Buddhist texts and traditions more generally. And I think that this can be hard for some people insofar as they want to see the Buddha as this kind of emotionless, he is above those kind of human, human-y things like emotions, and this is a purely sort of logical discourse. And I, I think that you'd probably agree with me that to assume that Buddhist texts are not emotional or not using the emotions or playing to the emotions uh, is to miss a lot of richness in them. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. And, and like I said, I've been doing some work on happiness and I've just been so struck uh, in the Pali Suttas, 
the number of words for happiness, the, the different kinds of happiness, the way that nirvana is, re is referred to as sukha or as happiness, um, the very playful work the Buddha is doing with conceptions of happiness in his context. Um, I've also written, I'm quite interested in love. Uh, for those of you who are going to take the class, we'll, we'll have uh, a, a bit of attention on, on Buddha Gosa's practices of loving kindness and compassion and sympathetic joy and what that looks like. So I definitely see um, emotions as just everywhere in the literature. And, um, and uh, I, I do think some of that modernist, highly rational kind of reading of Buddhism uh, has a certain kind of historical set of conditions behind it in terms of how we want to read Buddhism like that sometimes, but um, they're certainly not very uh, well supported by a lot of the sources, both the canonical and the commentarial sources in which it's uh, one's emotional life uh, is very richly described. Um, the Abhidhamma, for example, will be doing some Abhidhamma work in the course. Um, and of course, it's an extremely fine grained uh, treatment of human psychology and emotion, what we would call emotion terms, uh, are sprinkled throughout the Abhidhamma lists. And it's a very careful therapeutic um, management and introspective examination of what we would call the emotions. I should say that, of course, there's no word uh, exactly for emotions. Uh, in the poly material. Um, so emotions, as we use it in English, is only about 200 years old. Before that, even in the West, um, it, people didn't use the word emotion. They used passions or affects or um, the humors and, you know, uh, sentiments and things like that. Uh, so one of the things that I've been quite interested in is, is how do we, um, I think that we have we're living in a, in a world of English language universalism that doesn't get examined often enough, that we think that we have these English terms like emotion and, and that's how nature carved it up. And that's a classification given to us by nature. And, and, um, and I think that there's very good work um, by uh, um, both historians who've really called that idea into question, even in the West. Um, someone like Thomas Dixon has a, has a, has a book about how we went from passions to emotions and the, the, the development or this construction of the word emotion uh, in just the last several hundred years. And then there's also neuroscientists like Lisa um, Barrett Feldman, who, who's really questioned whether no, emotion is a, is a natural category. Or, um, and so for me, this project, I think that maybe Kate was referring to this new book I have coming out, um, this treasury of classical Indian emotions, is really trying to do the vocabulary or the lexica of emotions in classical India. Um, and so I, I can't really get away from this term emotion, right? That's our way into it, right? We're, so we're often stuck with the English categories, but I want to emphasize that, that I'm interested in any kind of emotion type word, affect, mood, disposition, um, and, and try to look at, at indigenous categories for emotion words. Um, Indian thinkers got along just fine without the term emotion, and yet they were describing uh, human experience uh, with a very kind of um, fine-grained set of analytical practices and developing their own theories of how human experience works. And so that's what I would say my work has been really uh, in the last several years and where I, I, I continue to be headed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that even this sort of category of emotions that we assume goes down to the root of our sort of psychology and how the world works, that yeah. part of that project of historicizing is in fact calling into question the way that we think that the world is organized. Absolutely. And showing that the provincialism of the modern West, that far from speaking in universalist view from nowhere terms about, you know, the scientific you know, furniture of the world and human experience, that it is one um, conception historically conditioned about what human experience is like. And that in fact, if we turn to ancient and classical India, you get equally sophisticated, if not even more finely grained treatments of human experience that don't operate from the same bedrock assumptions. So that's, that's really where my kind of passions lie right now with um, the kinds of work I'm doing is just trying to uh, give us give us real alternatives for the ways that people have examined human experience. Uh, the landscape of human experience has often been carved up quite differently than 
the way we in the modern West assume that it is, and then the, the rather sophisticated theories and therapies of emotion that we have from ancient India uh, operate in really quite different and yet really challenging and important ways. Mm -hmm. Yes, and whenever I teach uh, Buddhist, Buddhist ethics, um, and I see that you're teaching Buddhist ethics this uh, semester as well, um, Buddhism's deep attention to how it is that human psychology works as a necessary prerequisite towards any attempt to purify the mind or train the mind um, is, is one of the things where Buddhist texts really do you know, strike me as offering this really, really useful perspective that as you say, sort of forces us to recognize our own assumptions about how it is that the world works, how it is that we work as thinkers and feelers and doers. That's right. That's right. And so probably your course, much like my course, it deals to a fair bit with moral psychology or moral phenomenology. What are we actually like as human beings emotionally? What is our agency actually like? Um, what are the causes and conditions that bear upon um, human beings making moral choices or even seeing clearly in the first instance what their choices might be. And so those are kind of uh, some of the kinds of questions that um, I think Buddhist, as Kate says, really um, sort of are really good on, um, and, and, you know, and perhaps go a good deal deeper than a lot of um, Western ethics does. Mm -hmm. Or even, um, you know, Western sort of standard psychological assumptions, which can sort of often start with our English language and assume that that is, those are the relevant categories for analyzing experience. That's right, that's right. Um, and let's see, I know that you are, um, uh, as so many of us in academia are, you know, crushed by this part of the semester, so I don't wanna hold you for too long. Um, but one final question I did wanna ask is, I saw that another class that you're teaching this semester it's just called Cool Buddhist Texts. <laughs> yes. Um, and, and I love that just because I'm often trying to think of, of, of how to frame my classes as attractive to 19-year-olds. And those of you listening to the podcast will have some sort of natural interest in Buddhism, but often much of my life is spent trying to, you know, get people interested. Um, <laughs> and I'm always like, oh, how do I frame this as cool? And, and in your framing of just cool Buddhist texts, I thought was brilliant. And so maybe if you could speak even very briefly, because I know that you have lots of stuff to do, you know, what makes a Buddhist text cool for you? <laughs> oh, okay. Cool. This class. Yeah, so, so that, this is a new course I'm teaching, and it, it came out of a kind of um, departmental discussion of, that we should have some more advanced level courses in our department. Um, and we tend to offer a lot of 100 and 200 level courses. Most of our students who take our courses are not going to be religious majors or specialists in Buddhism. And so we're serving a, a broader population, but we want to develop more advanced level courses. And so this is a 300 level course. And then I was sort of thinking that a lot of my classes are courses are very interdisciplinary. So even the, the Buddhist ethics class that Kate was just talking about, we read Buddhist scriptures, we read philosophy, we read anthropology, we read a whole range of different types of materials, because I want my students to have a kind of nimbleness with different disciplinary approaches we use in the study of religion. But um, I am, at the end of the day, a textual scholar, and I'm interested in all these kinds of textual questions that Kate and I have just been talking about. So I thought, well, what if I would offer a, a, an advanced level course that is on about texts and not just the reading of texts or the philosophical or literary qualities of texts, but texts as objects and texts as ritual objects and texts historically and how they've worked. Um, in time, texts that have been worn on the body or texts that have been chanted and recited, something like the Heart Sutra or the, all the Mahayana Sutras. Um, and so I just, and then I thought, well, I don't know exactly what I want to do in that class. You kind of often have to do things way before you're ready to actually teach the class. You have to give it a name. And yeah, so I was like, why don't we just call it cool Buddhist text and I'll fill in the details later. <laughs> right. And so this semester I have had to fill in the details. Um, but for me, it's, it, it has, it has both literature and philosophy and scripture. Um, cool Buddhist texts I find are really arresting emotionally. So we've read some hard, um, uh, literary texts that, that present the Buddha in very difficult terms, something like the Vaisantra Jataka or the, the, the beautiful Kavya poetic treatment of um, 
of, of the of handsome Nanda, which is a really kind of uh, challenging literary text to read. Uh, right now, we're in the middle of some Mahayana sutras, the Heart Sutra, the Diamond Sutra. We're actually reading the Garjana right now, um, and being kind of thrown back on ourselves in terms of um, the negative dialectics of the Madhyamaka style of thinking. Um, we're going to be reading the Larepa. So it really is just. Um, an opportunity for me to read cool. And we're going to be reading some Dogen and the Platform Sutra. So it's going to cover a lot of different parts of the of, of the Buddhist world by the time we're done. But texts that have been challenging to their audiences, um, that are challenging to us, that thwart some of our expectations of what Buddhism is supposed to be, um, that have living traditions around them that were, these were texts that had a cult around them in some cases, or texts that, um, their manuscript history is interesting or texts that have traveled far from their original birthplace. Um, we're reading the Melinda Panha, which is a text I'm translating right now, as Kate mentioned, this really fascinating uh, memory of, of a conversation between a Greek king and a Buddhist monk, uh, an extraordinary text uh, by any measure in terms of how to think about it historically and, and, and its importance in, in terms of ways that it's it's putting Buddhist teachings. So it really was just a grab bag kind of <laughs> title that I hoped would grab students like, cool, this is like really going to be fabulous. Um, but uh, that is also like just an opportunity to sit around and read and talk about text from multiple dimensions and to also just read really cool Buddhist literature. Hmm. Yes, and that's always, you know, part of, um, you know, why I'm interested in Buddhism, what I keep coming back um, is, yes, I think it's useful. Yes, I think it's morally beneficial. Yes, my life has been changed by my encounter with Buddhist traditions. Um, but it's also just really cool. And I appreciate that that course is taking that idea of coolness and um, recognizing it. Well, I will say that I have teenage sons, which makes me, I do, profoundly uncool. Um, and so they pointed out to me that by calling it cool Buddhist text, I was making it profoundly uncool. Um, but I, I guess I'm hoping that our college age students are a little more forgiving than the sharp eyed uh, early teenager <laughs> in terms of how these things work. <laughs> it's tough to, tough to please a, a teen. Yes. That's a race most of us are never going to win. <laughs> um, but with, with that, I'll, I'll thank you so much for your time. Um, Dr. Maria Haim uh, is teaching our next course, Buddhist Studies Online 202, Visuddhi Maga, The Path of Purification. So if you'd like to hear more about some of the stuff that we've talked about in this podcast, check out that course. Um, and, and thank you so much for talking with us today. Really appreciate it. Thank you very much, Kate, both for this uh, discussion, but also for all that you're doing for this particular um, online uh, school for Buddhist studies. I think it's really important. Great. Thank you so much. And we'll see you all next time on the Buddhist Studies Podcast. Okay. Bye. 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 Bye.